afternoon and welcome to the Women's Power Hour show, part of our self-care series. And joining me today is the wonderful Dr. Martina Topic, who is reader at Leeds Beckett University. Lovely to have you with us today, Martina. Hello, thank you for inviting me. I'm really honoured to be part of your show. Fantastic. Well, listen, uh, lots of good meaty questions to get through because um, I know that you are, I want to say like an expert researcher. You kind of know the, the, the depth and the belly of this stuff that we talk about around self-care and, and women's well-being and feminism and all of that stuff. So um, I really want to jump in. But I think what would be really beneficial for our listeners is to just find out a little bit about you, who you are and about the different work that you do. OK, so uh, I come from a journalism background uh, and I was a journalist uh, in my homeland, Croatia, and I also did some writing for some Italian and Slovenian magazines. So it's all about, it was all about writing. So the switch to academia was uh, very natural in a way, because now I write for a living as well, just that I do research and then write up my publications. But uh, my research is mainly about uh, the media, due to professional background. And then I also developed this um, big uh, women's studies agenda as well. So I've been studying first women in journalism, which kind of makes sense because that's my background. But then I extended it also to uh, public relations and uh, advertising because my field is basically communication and I'm a sociologist of communication, basically. So I've been researching in particular um, cultural masculinities uh, at work. So it's an organizational research that looks at how women are treated in the organization and how they fit in or don't fit in. And then because I'm a sociologist, I link this to the socialization and what we did when we were growing up. So I've been asking women I interviewed, um, did you play boys or girls, what kind of stuff you did to and then link this to the communication and behavior we develop later in life. And then what my research shows basically is that it's women who play with boys and grew up with men who kind of succeed more in the organizational life rather than women who played with girls and did more feminine stuff. So it's been very interesting uh, actually to speak with these women, but also sometimes stressful because sometimes issues like sexual harassment and a really blatant discrimination came out in interviews as well. Yes. So those who say we don't no longer need feminism, I really, really object to that and say you are wrong. <laughs> yes, okay. So there are still plenty of issues out there. Now, when you when you talk about women who probably grew up playing more with boys, being more successful, is that specific to the corporate world, or would you just say that's generally across all all boards? Well, so far I've done a research uh, mostly on corporations, uh, so I haven't done research, for example, on SMEs uh, yet, uh, but I do have another project where I'm specifically looking at SMEs, so we will see. But in the, in public, in the field of public relations, it seems to be across uh, because of, in that project, I spoke with women working in PR agencies as well as those who work uh, in in-house departments and corporations. And actually, it seems to be even more present in agencies than it is in corporations. And it's the same actually for advertising, where I also spoke with both. Uh, just that advertising is a little bit more across both corporation and SMEs, whereas in PR it seems to be actually this smaller level, which really surprised me. You would think it would be corporations, but yes. actually it's even less. Wow. So. It seems to be an issue that appears across communication industries, at least, that yeah. I research. Wow, OK, interesting. Interesting to hear that. Now, I know having visited your website, um, you're a socialist, eco-feminist, working class academic, or this is the titles that you use, right? Um, yeah. Equality <laughs> enthusiast and vegetarian animal lover. <laughs> I love all of that, which speaks to, which tells me that you're, you're incredibly connected to the natural world and, and all of, you know, really yeah. connected with, with people <laughs> and things. Has that grown out of your work or was that just always who you were? Well, I've been a vegetarian since uh, February 2008 and I've always loved animals. Uh, so it's just uh, how, how I always was. I was always uh, uh, attracted to animals and they like me as well. I've never been bitten or attacked by an animal. <laughs> so I just decided in 2008, I just don't want to eat them anymore. 
um, not judging anyone who does. I'm uh, very much aware it's part of our uh, culture and uh, many people don't want to give up, but I just don't want to. However, ecofeminism is not something I'm all, I've always been. That's relatively new and I've embraced that approach in maybe last two or three years. Yeah. Uh, and I found out interestingly uh, about ecofeminism from this uh, woman magazine called uh, Womankind. It's published in Australia by a editorial collective and it's a magazine without adverts and it's all about you know well-being and self-care and just you know looking after us uh, so it, it doesn't have that patriarchal you know um, connotation when they just tell you oh, how to be pretty how to get a guy nothing like that so i find out actually from that magazine more uh, about ecofeminism and i said but this is me so yeah. I started to explore it a little bit more and uh, I embraced the philosophy and even wrote the book, which is getting published um, this year in October uh, on ecofeminism as well. Okay. So it's a really nice philosophy, uh, in my view, uh, about how the oppression of women is linked to the oppression of nature. So the same toxic masculinity that oppresses women and that treats us, you know, in, in a way that they shouldn't be treating us. He's also exploiting the nature through capitalism and uh, grab yeah. for profit and exploiting the resources and also technology, which ecofeminists uh, do not see as something particularly beneficial, but actually something that will not only not help humanity, but will even make the problems worse. Yeah. So it's a very radical and uh, a leftist uh, philosophy. It's not for everyone, but <laughs> I, I just found myself uh, in that. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. And not all eco feminists are vegetarian, I have to point out. <laughs> Some of us are, but not everyone. <laughs> Good. Well, I look forward to that book because that sounds really interesting. I think that, you know, that whole thing of connecting, you know, women and nature and, that, and the masculinity and, and all of those things that suppress us and how that also plays out in how they treat the world, I think, is, yeah. is huge. I, I kind of that's that's really intriguing for me so okay great Martina a wonderful introduction well, let's just take a break and then we'll come back and continue the conversation Studio. Uh, joining me today is Dr. Martina Topic, who is reader at Leeds Beckett University. She has been sharing some of her own story and journey, how she got into the work that she's doing, um, and also some of the, uh, and, I, and I, although I'm going to call them labels, but some of the titles that she uses to describe herself, socialist eco-feminist, working class academic, equality enthusiast, and vegetarian animal lover, uh, which for me all speaks into well-being all speaks into a care for the planet and the natural world so um, i'm loving it already now martina the the next question that i wanted to ask you you, you did touch on the work that you do and, and you the researching of women in the workplace and you've been doing this quite extensively for the past sort of three years or so um and in particular as you said pr journalism and advertising what yes. what are some of the common challenges that women face in terms of social conversation and office culture in these environments okay so that's been actually a large part of my research uh, is the office culture because if you look at available academic research you will just find some uh, old books for example uh, that narrate the situation for women secretaries in the 20s or the 30s and it's mostly in the u.s context as well which is fine and i draw from american researchers and use their work and then ascribe it uh, to europe but uh, i then try to implement it uh, here in england uh, when i spoke to women and i interviewed more than 80 women uh, all together across three industries and i was asking them what's the office culture for you you know who do you talk to what are the social interactions do you talk to other women do you talk to other men are you in a mixed office and uh, together you kind of hang out and you have these um, office conversations i also asked them about banter is there a bantery culture um, in offices uh, because i know from the literature that this is something that is more ascribed to uh, men rather than uh, women and i was asking also about uh, any form of discrimination that they perceive comes out comes as a result of the office culture. And I need to point out, I'm not trying to slag off uh, these masculine women because I've actually been one of them uh, in the past. I can get on with men, I can engage in banter. And I'm, in some ways, I'm even more able to find a common ground with men because I'm a sports fan than with women. So I just, 
it was just like an eye opener I had in 2018 about this issue and that maybe I'm the part of the problem and not being enough feminine in that sense. So I've been researching and this research became an activism as well. So what happened is what woman told me and I, it, it, I could just have flashes from history, you know. <laughs> they said that in offices where there are lots of men, there is a, this big culture of banter, uh, which can be sexualized, which can be very brutal. And they really, like they said, dig into each other and not all women feel comfortable with this. And then also they said there is big sports culture if there are offices with lots of men and then they kind of fall out. But then they said these informal structures and informal things then also sometimes affect promotions. So, you know, if you're able to engage in this kind of conversation, it's more likely that you will find a common ground with a you know, man on top. So one woman, which was really interesting, this was from advertising, actually said that she forced herself to learn about sports and to follow what's happening so that she can come on work on Monday and be able to ask questions and be knowledgeable. And I was just thinking, well, I follow because I'm interested. But why would she have to follow if she's not interested? You know, this shouldn't really affect you. And the more I researched, the more I realized that sometimes I got some opportunities in life because I was able to have these conversations. Yes. So this research basically changed me as well. So I started to actively monitor women, how they behave and whether they fit into this feminine paradigm. And then I've been trying to push them ahead to do more and help them actually uh, grow. But the problem is that many of us are not aware of this issue. We yeah. don't see it. We just see this, to, you know, it is what it is. Uh, I wasn't aware, for example, in the past that maybe I could have supported women uh, more and helped them more because this goes back again to my research on socialization. I grew up with boys. I, I was um, my uncle looked after me and we watched football. So I developed this competitive um, nature. I developed uh, knowledge of football. My knowledge of football goes well back to my childhood. I can speak about World Cups from the 1990s and stuff. Yeah. So I can speak with men. But women who were, for example, pushed to play with, you know, dolls and, you know, cooking stuff and everything, they can't. And then because of these informal structures, they fall off the ladder. So I think that's something we need to be actively addressing. And I really try to do that now. Yeah. Well, I think that's absolutely fascinating that this woman felt she needed to go and study sport in order to go to work, yeah. in order to be able to be promoted, to be seen even, much less be promoted, to be actively <laughs> seen. I mean, that's pretty scary that that, that, that that's happening now. That was last year, the interview. Yeah, that's, I mean, it, it's yeah. amazing. I mean, having worked in offices in, in you know, many years ago, uh, I think there is... There is definitely a culture thing that, that happens. And, and if there are certainly more men than women, it tends to be very driven uh, by that banter and the sports thing. And, and as you said, the sexualization uh, that goes on in the conversations, which can be incredibly uncomfortable. Yeah, that's a, a fascinating, fascinating research. Um, and I would say probably well needed and well overdue. Yeah, well, this research has been done uh, before in other contexts. Uh, it just wasn't done in the communication industry. So I've been drawing, for example, from a sociological theory uh, of uh, Pierre Bourdieu, Bourdieu, who is a man, actually, uh, but a French sociologist who wrote a book on masculine domination. And what he said, basically, is that not only that this problem exists, that there is this, uh, you know, uh, harassment, and he, and what he particularly said is harassment is not just sexual harassment. You don't have to be attacked sexual, sexually to be harassed. You can be, you know, put down or expected to do stuff that you can't do, yes. and this can be seen as a harassment. And then what he says, and what really also came out of my data and my interviews, is that we internalize this oppression. We just see it as something normal and everyday that we don't even challenge it enough. And this is what I found in data that I was asking women to identify basically like what do you think takes to become a leader, to become a manager, which characteristics? And as a, almost as a rule, they tell me characteristics such as, you know, toughness, uh, be uh, able to give as good as you get, uh, be, uh, you know, not show emotions, not be sensitive. But these are all characteristics associated with masculinity. This is how boys are raised. This is not how, I mean, I was raised like that because my mom is tough, my uncle was tough, you know, they just <laughs> raised me in that, in that way. But not all girls have this. Many are raised to be sensitive, to be girly, what it means to be a girl. And then how do you expect that kind of woman to come to an organization and be able to say, shut up while I speak? She'll just be silenced. Because I can react aggressively if I have to. I will say, excuse me, can I say something? I'll do it if I, if I feel like it. But uh, 
not everybody can do that. Yeah. It's not how you're raised. Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because I still think that there's this very, you know, we, we have boys and they're brought up this way. We have girls and they're brought up this way. Just that very gender splitting from an early age is bound to yeah. rear its head and cause issues later on in life. It's going to happen, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah, fascinating. Okay. Right, Martina, let's have another break. Um, and when we come back, we'll continue the conversation. studio it's the women's power hour show and my guest today is dr martina topic who is giving us some very uh, huge insights into the world of pr and advertising journalism and how women are seen treated um, expected to behave do behave in those environments um, and what i'd really like to know as we move on with that conversation martina is you know how have these challenges affected women in terms of their confidence and their well-being well well-being is obviously an issue because you have this um, long work hours culture which is particularly uh, prominent in the communications industry so journalism advertising pr i've seen once uh, some time ago on linkedin when someone said you know it's pr not er and that really explains it very well. So you have these long hours and women were telling me, you know, especially if you have clients from Australia or America, where there is a time zone issue. So you are expected to answer your emails or pick up a phone at 2 a.m. So you work nonstop. And this is something also that is in uh, some feminist literature recognized as uh, masculine, because in the past, it's only men who worked. Women stayed at home, look after children, after the family. So they develop this work first kind of culture. Yes. which can work again for some women, but it doesn't work for all, especially because we still have this social expectation that uh, women will look after children, after family, maybe go part time or all these expectations. So th this is an issue uh, because, uh, for example, in the advertising, it remains a very uh, young industry yes. because women just uh, leave in journalism as well. Um, a lot of them go freelance and part time. Uh, they just walk away, uh, not just because of banter and this masculinity in the organization, but also because of this expectation. And then what some, for example, journalists uh, told me, and she's only in her 30s, so she's very young. And she said, I wouldn't dare to have a child now because I, I, I'm too early in my career. I would not be seen as serious enough if I actually uh, took a maternity leave. And then they also said, even when you do take a maternity leave and you come back, you're just seen as as if your priorities somehow changed, as yes. if you can't be committed to both. So for me, it's okay because I don't have children, but I can see the issue uh, from women who do have children, uh, which is a very uh, big issue. And it causes issues with well-being. I mean, even for men who work long hours, why do we need to work this much? Work hours is seen as a woman's issue, but it's also for men. Yes. I mean, it's crazy that people work from 9 a.m. until 2 p.m. And then some said in journalism, for example, in interviews, some of the freelancers said, I know people who never had, you know, have had partners for years, uh, never got married, don't have any time, you know, on their own. And is it worth it? Why do we need to work this much? Which is, again, why I embrace ecofeminism, because it's also a critique of capitalism. And it says, you know, this is how capitalism affects women as well. Yeah. Uh, we just work too much. We do too much because we you know, work for organizations that only care about profit. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that is a driver, right? That is a driver. And and you're absolutely right. When we talk about working long hours, it's not it's not about women working long hours, it's about people working long hours. And actually exactly. what that does for their physical health, their mental well being, their emotional well being, all of those things are affected. Um, you know, when we're not resting enough, not having time downtime, all of that. Um, so so that's really across the board. And so I, I guess I want to go back to, I mean, this, this work that, you're, that you are doing, have been doing, why do you think it's important for us to really acknowledge your findings and what needs to happen on the back of the findings, your findings and anyone else in that space who's, who's doing this kind of research? Well, I think it's relevant for people to hear about it because they can reflect 
and maybe change something in offices and in the organization. So my research into this has actually been inspired by, a, uh, by an article by Eleanor Mills, who was at the time at the time when I discovered the article in 2018, an editor in chief of the Sunday Times. And she actually said, you know, that women who succeed to senior positions by the time they do so become so blockified that other women don't see them as role models. And then when I extended this to other research and I found works from the US from Caroline Klein, who talked about queen bees, saying what, you know, when women do go up, they pull up the ladder and act like, you know, I succeeded in a masculine world, so you can do it or just go away. And this also appears in data. So both of these things still keep appearing. But what happened is that when I read that first article by Eleanor Mills, I realized I'm being part of a problem. So I started to, not only do research, but actually actively change. So I don't know, I think it was in, it was before the pandemic. So I think at some point in 2019, we had this situation that in the past I wouldn't recognize at all. So there was a position at our university. We have, for example, I'm an ethics coordinator for the research. And then we have these meetings every three months. And it was uh, the guy who actually coordinates the whole thing said, I need one more LREC. Does anybody know anyone who they could recommend? And nobody's, you know, said anyone he said i'll see who i can find and then i went back from that meeting and i bump into this uh woman colleague and i told her uh well there is this position she said oh i would need that to actually apply for a promotion so i said well go and ask him he doesn't have anyone and she wouldn't go she was too shy and afraid to go and ask this man who is not sexist by no means i mean i know him very well this colleague and she just wouldn't go. So eventually what happened in the past, I would just say, well, you're not up for it. If you don't want to go and ask proactively, what can I do? That would be my mindset in the past because yes. I would always go and ask and grab and go and just grab things for myself to go ahead. But because of this research, I said, no, you have to go and ask because he doesn't have anyone and he will take anyone because he's desperate. He really needs another person in the team. So eventually I ended up refusing <laughs> <laughs> refusing uh, her and you know exit from the building and I said you're not leaving this building alive unless you go and ask and I refused and she tried to she was he he you know smiling and laughing and she tried to get out and I was blocking the exit and saying no you're not leaving this building until you go and ask him and I was and I pushed her gently to go and I was following her because she kept turning and seeing me so she had to go and ask and she got the position and then she applied for a full-time contract and she got it and you know and she said I can't believe you did this you know but these are the little things that help because she was very well qualified for that position. I didn't push someone who doesn't deserve it. She yes. has a PhD, she has publications. She could be an ethics coordinator for research. Yeah. But in the past, I wouldn't do this had I not been doing this research. It just wouldn't occur to me. I would say, ah, well, you know, don't go ahead then if you're yeah. not going to ask. But That's now I know that sometimes people need that little push, even if it's brutal a little bit, you're not leaving this building alive. <laughs> <laughs> But, but but I think that's also I supportive. I mean, in you know, however yeah. you did it, you were doing it for her benefit, and you knew and you yeah. could see that it would help her take the next step that she wanted to, right? Yeah, well, she gave me a reference for a teaching qualification later on saying I helped her actually. And she always mentions when she sees me, yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> so she did appreciate it. She thought I'm joking anyway, which I didn't. Yeah. I said, you're not leaving the building unless you ask. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. But these are the little things that people can maybe take from my research and just realize that sometimes you need to push some people. You need to recognize that if, if a person is shy, it doesn't mean they're not qualified and that they wouldn't do a good job. You just need to push them to ask because they're afraid. Absolutely. So just give them that encouragement, that support, um, you know, and if need be a little bit more heavy encouragement, <laughs> should we say. Um, but it works. And, and you are, you're absolutely right. I think for some people, it is incredibly easy and comfortable to just step up to the plate and put yourself out there. And, you know, but that is not for for everyone. Um, and I would say, no. actually, it's not for the many. Uh, so encouragement and support is hugely hugely important so i think that that's such a, an important point that you raised um on how we can take the research and do something with it something actively so um yeah i love that okay one more break martin then when we come back i want to speak to you a little bit more about well you know very well what it is to be overworked so we're going to speak a little bit about that and self-care and coaching and, and the things that you use to help you Oh, 
part of this interview come chat with the lovely Dr. Martina Topic, who has been sharing with us some amazing insights, I think, into the world of PR journalism and the advertising industry uh, and some of the challenges that women face in those environments uh, and also how her research is perhaps giving us an opportunity to do things differently and, and help each other more, which I think is absolutely vital. I know from previous conversations that we've had that you've recognised in your own life how easy it is to become overworked. Um, it's not always intentional, it's not where you start out, but it does happen. What have or are you doing to address this? Well, fortunately, I've taken a coaching training uh, since December I started it. And then, you know, as part of that coaching, uh, I had to be coached as well as coach others. And that really helped me reflect. And then also a big part of coaching is mindfulness. Uh, so, you know, at each session we were asked to do breathing exercises and just relax, be in the moment. And that really made a difference, especially since uh, our tutor was asking us actually look at this photo of the nature and just breathe and relax and then and just let it go, let go all the work and just be in the moment. And that, that really made a difference because I realized then I'm not, I'm in this lockdown because we've been locked up uh, at my university since March last year. We haven't been able to teach on campus, work on campus, anything. Very little teaching, but no office work or anything. And I realized I'm not actually going anywhere. I'm not doing anything. I'm locked up. I'm working too much because my office is here and my living room is here and just this blurred boundary between work and private life and I'm not doing anything. So I just start to force myself to go out every day for a daily walk. And uh, I found also there is a duck pond uh, so because I like animals, so I go now and feed the ducks and swans, and now also pigeon joint and try and is you know they're asking me for food now as well, so I'm feeding them all. But this gave me a massive motivation to go out every day, and now I just can't miss it. So before this interview, I went, so I, it's not too late after I finish with the interview, you know, and all this. So I'm trying really to find time now, and it motivated me to go out every day to feel um, a bit better and just you know because it's healthy to walk or to walk. And in my case, I also like animals. I like uh, helping them out. So, you know, feeding them and all this. It really relaxes you and helps you wind down a little bit and break that cycle of non-stop work. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that's so true. And it's finding those pockets of time and finding those things that work for you because everyone's different. So they'll be drawn to different things. Uh, but then kind of making them like it's like an appointment with yourself for yourself that you you kind of see through knowing actually that when you do it everybody benefits you know you come back with a clearer head which means when you get back into work you're in a better state than when you were when you left it and all of that yeah it does it does really make a difference and uh, I'm not as nervous and anxious as I was because I wasn't even aware before this uh, training that I'm really really constantly and anxious because you just work non-stop when you're at home. It's just so easy to fall into that uh, pattern. Because I don't do just research, and it requires lots of reading, lots of interviewing, transcribing, analyzing. But it's also teaching, meetings, and all this. It, it just kind of eats you alive. So I think it's really important to find uh, at least that. I stay maybe for an hour and a half uh, in this walk, which is not a lot of time, but it does make a difference. Yeah, absolutely. Did you find it difficult? So being somebody who was like so fully engaged in your work, like 24 seven, did you find it difficult to take those first steps into having time for yourself? Did it feel uncomfortable? What was that like for you? Yeah, it, it, it did. I realized also I would go to feed the ducks and swans and then on the way back there is one little stream with water so you can listen to the sound of water and the birds are singing in the tree. So I sit usually there with a cup of coffee uh, to go that I buy and just relax. But I realized I'm still using my phone and answering emails. So I was like, why are you doing this? This is like a lunch break or whatever. Even, you know, yes. you should be allowed to have this break. So I'm now trying to, so I basically, you know, started to try to stop using the phone. Yeah. I still carry it with me because it monitors how much I walked. Uh, yes. So it kind of reminds me and forces me to actually go out every day. So I meet my goals of walking and exercise, but I'm trying not to uh, answer emails anymore. Good for you. Quite right too. I, I, I mean, my phone goes everywhere, but then I, you know, when I'm out walking, I have my music. So, I mean, you know, we're, there's so much on our phones now other than other than the, the work stuff that we do. But I think you're absolutely right. Being able to take it with you, but still being able to disengage from work is really the key practice here. Well, listen, 
you've shared so much and I think there's been some really juicy stuff there and I really am looking forward to the publication that you've got coming out in October. Um, it would be really good for our listeners to find out where they can find out about your work, um, so you know, website and, and so that they too can really start looking at some of the research that you've been doing. Okay, so I do have a website. It's uh, www.martinatopic.com. Uh, so all my list of publications is there. There are links. Uh, some of them are in the open access uh, publications. Some are not, but they can be found via a Leeds Beckett website as well because we have open access. So if someone uh, clicks on a publication, there is a button that says request access. And then the email goes to um, our colleagues in the open access team who will then email me and ask, do you want to share this? And then I will. Uh, so it, it, it is a bit of a procedure, but I'm very happy to share my work. Alternatively, everybody is welcome to connect with me via LinkedIn and just send me a message and say, I'm interested in this paper. Could you send it, please? And I'll be very happy to share. You know, research is like you're very passionate about it because I am. That's how I ended up working so much. So I'm very happy to share and for people to read my work. Yes. So it's really not a problem. Wonderful. Fantastic. Well, Martina, thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing this information, for the insights. You know, the work that you're doing is, is so needed. And I think that we need to be having these conversations and bringing all of this stuff to the forefront. We cannot keep on putting this stuff on the shelf. We, we learn a little bit and then we tuck it away. We need to be keeping this front and centre so that real change can happen. So thank you so much on behalf of all women and men <laughs> for the <laughs> thank you. work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It was a pleasure to speak yeah. with you. My pleasure.